All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Well, let's go ahead and get started. It's 12 o'clock. Welcome to Medical Grand Rounds at the University of Colorado. Um, we are very pleased to be back in person today. Uh, for those who can make it in person, we're encouraging you to do so this year, uh, especially while it is safe. Uh, we are in RC2 in the Krugman Conference Hall. We will, for all of our offsite uh, listeners and also our affiliate hospitals, be broadcasting all year on the Zoom channel, but we're really encouraging people to come here in person. Uh, just a little preview of what's coming up on October 19th, Dr. Jen Adams, faculty at Denver Health, will speak to us about the new CU medicine curriculum and, and inclusive of LIC models nationally. And then on October 26th, our chief medical officer here at UC Health, Dr. Gene Kuttner and professor of medicine, will talk about leading in complexity and what it's like to lead from the hospital standpoint in an increasingly complex environment for academic medical centers. As a reminder, uh, you can use your QR code here to get CME and MOC credit for all medical grand rounds this year. And questions will come primarily from our live audience, but we are also taking questions. Thank you to the chief medical residents uh, who are gonna monitor the Zoom chat and make sure that questions can come from across the city. Uh, now I am very pleased to welcome Dr. Amaran Badashvili. Dr. Badashvili is a assistant, associate professor in the Department of Medicine here at the University of Colorado in the Division of Hospital Medicine. And since 2022, this past summer, he's been the Associate Vice Chair of Education in the Department of Medicine. Dr. Badashvili is also an adjunct assistant professor of medicine in the Division of General Internal Medicine at Weill Cornell in New York. He did his undergrad training at SUNY Stony Brook, the State University of New York at Stony Brook, where he graduated summa cum laude. Uh, he did his medical school training also at Stony Brook University, where he was AOA and a recipient of the RNLP Gold Humanism and Excellence in Teaching Award. His uh, residency was then at New York Presbyterian Weill Cornell. And as I said, in 2019, we were lucky enough to recruit him here to Colorado. Dr. Badashvili has been a leader and an innovator in medical education at both institutions. At Cornell, he was the course director for the Evidence-Based Medicine course, the founder and director of the Clinical Decision-Making Conference, the chair of the residency's CCC, their Clinical Competency Committee, and also the assistant director of the Hospital Medicine Fellowship and one of the associate program directors in their residency training program. Since coming to Colorado, he's taken on the roles of director of point-of-care ultrasound and clinical decision-making elective in the residency program. He's also the program director for the Advanced Hospital Medicine Clinical Scholars Program and the co-lead of the Division of Hospital Medicine Journal Club, and again this past summer, now an associate vice chair. Uh, he has been recognized a number of times, uh, both locally as well as nationally, for his excellence in mentorship, in leadership, and in education. In 2017, he won the Hospital Medicine Attending of the Year Award at Cornell. In 2019, he was the J. James Smith Memorial Award winner, which is House Staff Teacher of the Year. And in 2020, he was named one of Colorado's Pace Scholars. He truly is renowned. He serves as a member of the Society of Hospital Medicine Education Committee. And since 2017, he's been a tutor, uh, for, formerly a student, at the McMaster uh, University Legendary Evidence-Based Medicine Clinical Practice Conference, which has gone on for over 40 years in Canada. It really is a pleasure today to welcome Dr. Badashvili to Medical Grand Rounds. Thank you, Jeff, uh, for the kind introduction. Can you hear me in the back? All right, um, so thank you for the invitation to present. I do have a misfortune of uh, having to follow uh, Dr. Chopra's amazing presentation. So I would like you to all take a deep breath and lower your expectations as you exhale and it will go from there. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, digital education and the lessons I learned as I was developing an online course in, uh, in Bayesian reasoning. The objectives, I'll, I'll quickly tell you about the course that um, I uh, have been teaching in Bayesian reasoning um, and the need that arose that led us to having to transition to online form. Um, we'll uh, start with the repeated failures that I experienced trying to uh, get this uh, moved online. And uh, along the way, a few things I learned regarding designing a course, the content, um, uh, audio video creation interface, uh, some of the accessibility issues that I didn't uh, think about uh, ahead of time. A um, couple of things I learned about uh, continued education credits and the certification, some of the legal considerations and the initial results of the course rollout. Uh, I don't have any conflicts of interest. We'll mention some brand names, no investments in any of them, lots of stock photos uh, on this presentation. So uh, the Bayesian reasoning 
uh, course is uh, something that um, uh, you're, um, most of you, I'm sure, are familiar with uh, the general concept. Uh, it's the method of updating what we know. So pretest probability relates to what uh, we already know. And as we get more information, uh, we update the information um, and uh, our knowledge to calculate post-test probabilities. And this is oftentimes how we as clinicians approach decision-making when we are seeing patients. Uh, but it has also broader uh, uh, applicability outside of medicine as well in industry, economy, and so on. One of the core concepts that this course tries to tackle is this dichotomy fallacy that many tests are thought of as just positive and negative, but in truth, they are not. Uh, they produce wi wide variety of results. And we do have some sort of arbitrary or sometimes well-informed dichotomy where we uh, label everything above certain cut point abnormal and below that as normal. But intuitively, uh, through clinical practice, many of you uh, I'm, I'm sure all of you have realized that not all positives are created equal and not all negatives are created equal as it's dem demonstrated here. BNP stands for B-type natriuretic peptide, uh, for, uh, which could be helpful in assessment and diagnosis of heart failure. And here I'm demonstrating that 95 and 105 are two ends of that spectrum of normal abnormal, but we often, from our experience, we don't really treat them uh, that differently. So the course starts with teaching about basics of test characteristics, sensitivity, specificity, positive, negative likelihood ratios, um, and uh, teaching how to apply that in dichotomous world. But then we introduce uh, additional um, uh, caveats of how to move beyond dichotomy, how to interpret tests that have three outputs. And that leads to the continuous uh, light, uh, uh, tests that uh, are best interpreted using receiver operating characteristic curves. That's what ROC curves stand for and uh, multi-level likelihood ratios that we can derive. It, those are just a bunch of fancy words as uh, to really say, to really understand how the test result changes this is probability uh, without labeling them as simply normal and abnormal. That to interpret test results for what it is while, rather than which bucket it happens to fall into. So, the need, um, uh, there, there were multiple reasons why there was a need for transition to online form. This is, a, this is best delivered in a small group setting because this is not something that's best suited for didactic types of teaching. It's something where the learner has to encounter uh, the clinical case, discuss with colleagues, make mistakes, learn through those mistakes, and really develop a deeper appreciation of the Bayesian reasoning through that way. And that required holding lots of small group sessions, especially when the teaching was tailored for the residency program. Uh, and along the line, same lines, when this was rolled out in at Cornell, what ended up happening was that when residents got this course and med students complained to their leadership that, well, the residents are talking about these ROC curves and multi-level likelihood ratios on rounds. We have no idea what these mean. We need this uh, stuff as well. So uh, medical school uh, asked us to well, this, uh, to create course for them as well. And then faculty scratching their heads, hey, uh, my med student and resident were talking about this internal likelihood ratio. Can you do faculty development for us as well? So as you can imagine, that took a lot of time commitment from the educator standpoint to deliver small group style uh, sessions for a variety of type of learners. And also um, the concepts in Bayesian reasoning uh, at the beginning, at, uh, at least can be difficult to grasp and internalize. So we have learners who will speed through the content, but some who needed to slow down, move back, review and uh, move forward. So the small group, although of in many ways ideal a venue for teaching, didn't allow for dialing that pace up and down. And uh, as um, uh, this course was developed actually, uh, that's when um, uh, the PACE uh, uh, um, grant was approved prior to the pandemic, but this course was created through the pandemic and we didn't even had, we didn't ha had anticipated this issue, but then became very relevant um, as the in-person teaching became a lot more difficult. So uh, as I've outlined, there are many reasons uh, we considered transitioning this course to an online form. And uh, I was very 
lucky to be considered as one of the uh, recipients for PACE grant that allowed me to develop this course. So in the end, I had to just create a website, some videos. How hard could that be? So I sat down with my computer and got going. And I developed a few videos, and I'm, you know, I'm pretty happy about them. And I start, as a review process, I start listening to the videos, paying closer attention, and I notice construction sound and some beeping sounds. And I realized that, so my office is across the street from the Tower 3, I'm in Leprino, and all those beautiful sounds had made it their way into the Bayesian uh, reasoning videos. So I had to get rid of basically all of them. I had to start over. Um, and as I was listening to these videos, besides construction noise, then I moved to another room. I moved to one where we didn't have that noise, but I realized the fan was there. Every time there was AC turned on in the room, that rattling sound was in my videos. I wasn't happy about that either. Um, then as I was creating videos, I was speaking and annotating at the same time on a pad. And those annoying pencil clicking sounds were making their way into the video. I had to uh, get around that as well. And you know, it may be a surprise to some of you that um, English is not my first language, right? Um, so lots of mistakes, grammar issues. Uh, I'm terrible at using articles in, uh, in, in sentences. So I realized that uh, just um, uh, freestyling really wouldn't work. And also I developed this mic fright. So I'm alone in my room, there's no one there. No one's watching me. I start speaking, I freeze, I start sweating. It's like, oh my God, I feel like there's thousands of people in front of me, but I'm alone. But the anticipation that, that someone was gonna listen to it, it's just made it so hard. So um, first thing, I had to find a good microphone that I could filter out the uh, fan noise and construction noise and so on. So I, these are the few things I tried. Started with the Apple um, AirPods, wasn't really great. The Bose um, headphones, still the quality of the sound wasn't good enough. Then I went to some digital microphones, still wasn't happy with what I was getting. And uh, I settled with something called XLR microphone, which is an analog microphone. But then there is something called, um, let's see if this clicker works right there. So that red box right here is the audio interface, which takes that sound and cleans it up, converts it into digital sound which then connects to an iPad. Uh, and uh, that made uh, the sound a lot cleaner. And, uh, but to make sure that it was as good as uh, I could make it, I had to find a soundproof room. I learned that our library has a recording studio, which is soundproof. And that was really cool. Uh, I had no idea when I started out this project. Then, so here is the microphone with a filter and uh, stand, uh, audio interface I mentioned, the recording tablet, transcript was huge for me. I had to write out everything that I was gonna say, even though I had done it a million times in front of learners. Again, my fright was real, so I had to just read off the slides. I thought it, I would sound robotic, but I, I hope I didn't come off that way <laughs> at the end. So here is the setup, uh, and it's not actually very expensive. Um, this was probably less than $500 to put this whole thing together, this audio setup, and uh, hopefully made it sound into professional, uh, more uh, on the professional side of things. Um, so here are the list of different options that you have in uh, creating uh, audio content and uh, some uh, pluses and minuses in quality, additional hardware that's required. That's the case for the uh, XLR microphone, but really it's, uh, it produces that like podcast uh, type uh, audio. Next, well, another problem I had to solve is that, as I mentioned, as I was recording, um, the pencil tapping was there. So the way I got around that is that I found a program that allowed the separate recording of the audio and uh, video. So as you see, there are two um, contents that here are separately recorded, that, that's the audio. So I would record the audio first, and then I'll go back, mute the audio recording, and then I would uh, overlay the visual content on that. 
So that completely separated the process so I could pay attention to one thing at a time as I was creating these recordings. And uh, what was really neat, what's really neat about this particular um, app is that each, uh, I, this one right here, right? That creates a separate uh, sort of um, object on a video slide. So if I made a mistake or if I'm presenting something EBM related, but as new studies come out, content changes, I need to update it. I can simply delete this one number here, replace it, and I don't have to re-record the video. So it was really helpful to go back, fix mistakes, both audio and video uh, in these um, sessions. And also, uh, this is something that had good annotation, highlighter, and so on. This particular program is called Explain Everything. I think it was, I think it was like $70 per year. So it's not so bad. And uh, Yunan uses it for the new conference is very, very effectively. She's an expert at this program. Um, so there are lots of different options you can go with here when it comes to recording your videos. So you can start with just PowerPoint. You can create your slides and then record audio over that. Um, and you could use Zoom uh, for that. But there are some other uh, services with varying degrees of cost. Oftentimes, one theme I encountered was that many of them allowed you to create pretty decent videos, but you had to pay to export. So you had to use their own platform, and that came at cost. So there's these tricks built in. So it, that did require some homework, uh, some uh, research and homework up front to figure out, to find the best uh, version. I'm not going to go through all this. I just put this in here as a reference for next time if you want to go through the slides and explore um, some of the aspects of all these options that we have here. So few lessons learned, soundproof and quiet area was really important. For me, XLR microphone with a filter and the stand worked out really well with audio interface and separate audio and video recording really solved a lot of issues that I was facing. A data transcript with grammar correction was extremely helpful. And going back to these uh, videos, having a program that is really easy to edit is, is huge. That way there's a low activation threshold to update your videos. Um, other things that I learned uh, along the way. So what you're seeing right now is a contrast ratio between the text and the background. So there is a way to find out what is the ratio between two colors. And the recommended ratio actually is 4.5 to um, help those who may have color blindness. And uh, that is something that I didn't, uh, hadn't initially considered. So even though this looks not so bad, this is still not quite at the gold standard of the contrast ratio. And uh, many uh, online services do fail at that test. Uh, here is the website where you can uh, be simply uh, copy paste your foreground and background color, and it will give you the contrast ratio for uh, that particular combination. So something to be mindful of, if you have like blue text on a black background, the other way around, that could be difficult for some readers. Another one is closed captions. Um, and I learned that YouTube, for example, can automatically generate uh, the closed captions for you that you can go back and edit. So when you upload video, you can export the captions that are automatically generated, timestamped, you can go back and edit whatever the mistakes that have been made and then put it back into the video, which uh, makes it super helpful for those who want to use those uh, closed captions. Another thing I didn't know, if there is a, whatever uh, a video includes more than three flashes per second, so that's three hertz, that increases the risk of seizures. So if you're planning to use some sort of flashing, being mindful that uh, frequency of the flashes can help out your learners, not put them at risk if they have predisposition for, for seizures. So there are a variety of accessibility issues that I didn't know about and I learned through the process uh, that has to uh, do with a variety of types of disabilities. And one great resource I found was WebAIM, Web Accessibility in Mind. They lay out these resources, they have some training in different aspects on how to um, maximize your accessibility in all these different domains. So um, 
as I created these videos and trying to improve accessibility as much as I could, next question was, where are these uh, uh, videos or where is that content going to live? You have different options. And it could be simple as putting it on OneDrive and forwarding the link to your learners. And that's probably the cheapest option as we have the access uh, to these through the institutions, or you can use Google Drive for that. That becomes problematic if you expect lots of traffic. If you expect 100 learners to access it at the same time, they will probably experience some delays. YouTube is a uh, easy option that you are all familiar with. Ads can be distracting. So if you want to have ad free version, that probably that it, for that you have to pay for. Um, you have Vimeo as well, HubSpot. Some of them uh, allow you to, some of the questions to ask is, do you need your videos to have in video quiz functionality? To engage your learners, you may want to consider inserting quizzes. And some of these platforms allow you to add quiz. So as you're watching the video, it stops. There's a question, a learner presses the, uh, selects the answer, gets feedback, and the video continues. For example, HubSpot has a functionality, but it's uh, it could be pricey. Bookmarks can be helpful. Bookmarks allow the learner to just quickly go to the part of the video that is most relevant to them. It's kind of like uh, the object learning objectives, and they're marked by the time of when that section is addressed in the video. So that can be helpful as well, something to consider as you're developing, as you're uh, figuring out where to house your online content. And so you could think about the video hosting platform, but there are other options as well. Well, there's website builders out there, um, some, some more uh, steeper learning curve for sure. And there are some pricey, but uh, very easy to use drag and drop type of uh, services. And this is the one I ended up going with that helps you create pretty good looking um, websites without you having to know anything on how to, you know, HTML and whatever in a, on the back end. And uh, so definitely a lower learning curve. And there are options like Canvas that we have here, learning management systems. Because another question you want to ask yourself is, uh, what is your goal? What, what's the goal of your uh, online content? Uh, is it just for the learner to view it? Or do you want to engage them? Do you want to quiz them? Do you want to track their progress? If you have all those goals in mind, then learning management system may be the way to go in that case. And there are a large uh, uh, variety of options uh, there from free to pretty expensive. Okay, moving on to uh, CME credits and a couple of secrets I learned that I didn't know as I was going through the process. So ACCME, Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical Education, is this larger body that provides uh, institutions with an ability to grant CME. So they have given uh, UCH the ability to create CME certified courses or certified courses. So um, I, as a course creator, if I want my course to uh, be able to provide CME credit for my learners, I can go to my institution to certify my course. But that comes at price to administer the CME, meaning that as someone takes the course, there is a little uh, feedback they fill out. So someone tracks that, generates the CME credits, send it, sends it to the learners and they charge a price. What I didn't realize that is that there are competitive rates, that there is no one price for a certain number of uh, credits. And in fact, many uh, professional organizations, they also can certify your, your course and administer your CME. So here is a contrast of what CME costs here versus if you were to go through the AAFP, what would be the difference in cost. So the bottom line here is that these rates can be competitive if you're trying to get your course certified. Look around, there may be different options to find competitive rates. Um, now shifting gears to the legal questions that I asked and I found some questions, although some still remain unanswered. I'm gonna go through copyright, terms of use and intellectual property rights. So copyright, uh, turns out is assumed with copyright statement. You don't need to register anything. If you create content and you put a copyright statement, all rights reserved, that it is assumed that that 
content belongs to you. You don't need to seek patent for it. You don't need to go through any uh, bureaucracy to claim that as your content. However, that alone can be sometimes problematic if others want to use your content in, in meaningful and well-intentioned ways. So here um, comes in Creative Commons licensing. So this is six levels of licensing that you can put on your content that tells the third party who may want to use it what the rules are for your content. So you can say, you can do whatever you want uh, with my stuff. You can take my video, change it in the way you want it, and then post it and make money from it. So that's the most permissive. And then here is the least permissive, where you have to uh, obtain rights, sometimes pay for, uh, for those rights. And there is a lot in between. For example, some will let you just simply uh, attribute the content to the original creator and still host it on your website, uh, if, as long as the attribution is given. So the Creative Commons licensing simplifies that. And you could use this as a way to inform your audience uh, and third parties of what uh, they are allowed to do with your content. Terms of use. As I was creating these videos, I had to use um, figures from publications, like for example, New England Journal of Medicine. So um, if eventually I uh, this course becomes marketable and out there in the world, that could be a problem because I would be using New England Journal's figure to make money, technically. So for anticipating uh, those issues, it's good to consider terms of use. So if you go to an article, they all have a little copyright sign. If you click the copyright sign, it takes to copyright.com and where individual articles from all these journals are linked. And you can select why your, what is the goal of using the content. They ask you different questions. Uh, you're an academic institution, how many tables you are planning to use, in what form, uh, what, your, what your circulation is, and so on. And they give you a price. So some of the PACE funding went to buying rights for using these figures in my content. Intellectual property rights. So this I found <laughs> one of the most fascinating topics uh, as I was uh, learning more about uh, uh, the uh, legal uh, questions here. So the, the, the underlying question is who does this content belong to? So I've created this, but it, 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 it happened through a university funding. So if this becomes marketable and goes out there in the world and people are, people are willing to pay money for it, how is that money going to flow? Who really owns the content? So there was an update to copyright law in 1976. Before that, the copyright law had something called textbook exception. So if an academic uh, uh, person, uh, uh, is professor in university or so on, say, wrote a textbook to uh, teach the class, then the um, owner of that was uh, the professor. Even though the textbook, uh, textbook had been written, say, in anticipation of teaching at the university and with their funds, with, uh, the, on, on their time, still the ownership stayed with uh, the creator of the textbook. So that was an exception. However, when the copyright law was updated in 1976, that exception was omitted, but it was a common practice. So it was sort of unwritten agreement that, you know, things that you create to teach, I'm not gonna get into that because it's, it's, it's your content, you put uh, work into it and you're gonna own it, but that was unwritten. And that model worked because publishing textbooks can be expensive and, Textbooks that are very highly specialized, they may not have a greater, uh, too big of an audience. So they were not necessarily very profitable. But now here comes the online education where it doesn't cost much money to publish things. You just <laughs> upload them on a server with probably pretty low cost to maintain it there. And your audience potentially is really wide outside of the university. So now that has come to shaky grounds and there has been some litigations that where universities sued the content creators that they own the property and almost invariably they win. 
Uh, and that is because something called work for hire doctrine. So if the university can show that any aspect of your um, content could be used for teaching or use anything in a university to cr uh, create your time, a laptop that university had given you or a computer that you signed in, you worked on it, that is their, that puts the ownership on, on them. So by default, everything you create that relates to teaching belongs to the university. Um, and really the work around that, th there is no great works around it. There's some universities where they will uh, lay out policies of how they will share profits if online course is eventually going to generate profits. Some don't. There's a great variability you need to look at your own institution uh, and that changes with time. So it may not be the same tomorrow as it is today. But one of the most effective ways to handle this is pre-agreement. So if you're planning a big undertaking, that will take lots of your time and you're applying, you think that it will be uh, potentially profit generating, it's important, uh, it will be helpful to reach out and have an agreement ahead of time of how the profits will flow and who the content will belong to. Another issue becomes if you leave the institution, uh, what happens then? Because it's not necessarily in the university's best interest to just claim ownership because a lot of times this content needs updating and you are the expert of the content. If you don't update it, it falls apart. So there's, there's incentives of both sides to work together to make sure that uh, it's a win-win situation rather than a course that gets abandoned because university wants to claim right, but there's no one to continue to work on them. So um, that summarizes some of the initial results, uh, some of the initial uh, uh, things I learned uh, from going to, uh, designing uh, this uh, online course. But I would like to also share the results of uh, the course. As this was rolled out today, um, in, initially as a pilot for hospital medicine faculty, and after we fine-tuned things, last year this was uh, part of uh, the internal medicine residency curriculum. So pretty much all residents went through this course. So we have some data. So here is what the course looks like. So there are cases that uh, address different test results. You see that uh, the case presentation there, and the uh, learner is asked to specify well, what do you think is the pretest probability? They put that in, then they get some um, uh, results. The PCR here was uh, negative. You have the test characteristics to calculate likelihood ratios, you move on, and you talk about what is it that you would do to manage the patient. Uh, and this is all the things that I'm able to capture. And here's the video of, uh, that goes through different uh, things. Uh, some visuals of explaining sensitivity and specificity, how to think about them, how to calculate likelihood ratios, um, uh, and so on. And then going from pretest to post-test, what to do uh, de depending on who your patient is, how that test changes the disease probability, and so on. So it's a flipped classroom approach. The learner reads the, goes through the case, uh, commits to decisions, and they're able, then they see. Uh, me work through the uh, uh, problem. And those videos are generated through that, explain everything that I showed you before that app. Uh, here's the link to the course that um, you can uh, visit, we'll post this. So if you wanna just check it out and have a look around, um, you're welcome to. So here are the results of the initial faculty pilot. We had we convinced a, uh, 20 of them to at least started, and then uh, at the time when we collected this data, at least 12 had finished it. So uh, to orient you to this figure, each um, uh, pair of bars represents a, um, a type of uh, question. And sometimes there are a couple of questions, but usually there's just one in each category. And uh, y-axis represents a correct response within a category. And uh, in the yellow bar, you have a pretest, and the darker bar, you have post test uh, results. So, here is how our faculty performed on this question. So, kind of maybe decent defining sensitivity specificity, but once we went to a bit more complex issues of understanding um, the shades of gray in diagnosis of how a you know, little bit positive versus very positive change, this is probabilities there, uh, they encountered some struggle. But then 
we saw a pretty a remarkable improvement after they took the course. Uh, they most of them, and and these are these are faculty members, by the way. These are these are not trainees. They said most of them said their um, knowledge in Bayesian reasoning was very or somewhat weak. Only one percent said it was somewhat strong, and most of them felt they gained a lot of knowledge, and they were satisfied with the course. But to complement the qualitative side of this analysis, we also conducted qualitative interviews where we um, had them um, talk to us about how they felt about the course. They actually interacted with the course as they, um, uh, um, as we held the meeting to give impressions right there. And we recorded, transcribed, de-identified, summarized uh, the findings. So here are some of the things that uh, we learned through that. Overall, heavily clinical, and it felt pertinent. The math in Bayesian reasoning can be pretty daunting. <laughs> and it almost has to be baked into something that's very clinically relevant to capture their attention and keep their attention because they're not just learning about you know, numbers, they're learning how to take care of patients. So these are commonly encountered cases on hospital medicine wards and not really, vast majority of them actually real cases that uh, I had encountered in the years past, as opposed to hypothetical cases. And um, uh, the difficulty felt almost just right and, um, and it's almost, this is balance where it's too easy, you can lose the learner. If it's too hard, um, they, um, uh, you can lose the learner in that case as uh, well. So the progressive challenge was the, uh, something that a few of them noted that they really liked, the, uh, that the difficulty built up. So they felt really smart at the beginning, they saw things well, but then as it, uh, in each case added something little to the previous. And, uh, and, and that progressive challenge felt good. Uh, the pace, some felt it was too fast, some felt it was too slow, but that's the thing about online course. They all could, some of them said, well, I had to go back and rewatch the video a couple of times to really understand it. But some said, oh, I, I, I did on 2x speed. Uh, so allowed for tailored approach. Uh, there were some comments on design to minimize cognitive load. For example, I was trying to uh, try to be consistent that for example, sensitivity numbers were always the same color. Likelihood ratio was described always in the same color to reduce the, uh, to the cognitive load as the learner was moving through those videos. Um, and uh, this was really interesting. Uh, some of them talked about uh, that this approach helped them, um, didn't exactly say in those terms, but activate their system too. So many of you may be familiar with two types of decision making. One, automatic system one, based on our hunches and our intuitions and system two is more deliberative approach. And when you had to take a step back and simply ask, is, is it really just positive, negative? What does this really mean? How positive is this? That act alone helped them slow down enough to consider things at a slower pace, activate your system two and be uh, uh, more diligent in decision-making. And a uh, few of them commented how that approach may actually lead to reduction in noise and bias because you're sort of um, uh, trying to step away from intuitive decision making when you're trying to use uh, these tools. The phase two included um, rolling this out to internal medicine residents. And uh, it's a similar type of uh, figure that you'll see here. These are the results for the pretests. 161 uh, took the pretest. Uh, and again, similar to faculty, maybe a little better, I'd say here. <laughs> and, uh, and here are post test results. I, honestly, I was a little bit stunned that it was that good. Uh, that especially I expected uh, more poor performance here, uh, but I was wrong. Uh, our awesome residents put me wrong that they, they can really tackle these uh, difficult concepts and, uh, and develop some proficiency there. So post test was, taken by 138 residents when we collected this data. So here was the mean uh, score pre, meaning that uh, average resident, uh, median resident got 27% of the questions right, post-test uh, 82%. Most residents said they had none to one to three hours of instruction in Bayesian reasoning. And this includes PGY 1, 2s, and 3s. They've had few years clinical training and medical school. Uh, very few 
um, just around 10% felt they had more than that. And most of them were fairly satisfied uh, with the course. And here are some qualitative remarks in the feedback that they gave us. This course was great. I feel like it's very applicable to clinical medicine. And I feel like I have much better understanding of how test results should impact our clinical decision-making. Truly exceptional course, a lot of really eye-opening discoveries throughout this and very informative, but I think it would be better served in medical school or intern years. This person felt this was maybe too late and this kind of, this kind of concept should be taught um, earlier on in the, in the training. A few more, again, um, uh, they felt that they uh, started to really understand how to interpret the tests um, in more meaningful uh, way. And uh, uh, this person even said that there was a workbook of cases to continue working through this. They wanted more homework. When do residents ever ask for homework? Uh, so, uh, and lastly, uh, another thing that was really interesting to explore, and then we haven't really gone deep in this data, but uh, have all the intentions to, is look at a variety of responses that were recorded. Uh, one of them, for example, is how do residents, what's the variability in residents assessing pretest probabilities of different cases? So here, there was a case with a fairly high probability of heart failure. And you can see vast majority of residents. So here, y-axis is individual, it's a count of residents, and the x-axis is pretest probability based on them reviewing the case uh, blurb alone. Majority agree what the uh, pretest was for that. Similar, this was a bit trickier, so there was a little uh, greater variability, but still majority clustered moderate to high uh, pretest for heart failure. Similar for uh, COVID-19, but you see, we saw a bit greater variability in something that they are less likely to encounter, which sort of makes sense. Um, I, another thing that was interesting is when I presented the case, I gave them the test result and I asked for the intuitive adjustment of pretest. Said, okay, now take your pretest and give me your post-test um, given this test result. So here, by the way, was a case that involved there's two cases, one, a pulmonary embolism and other uh, heart failure case. And here, I was very pleasantly surprised. So here, uh, there was a patient with high pretest probability, about 40%, according to WOS score, who had a negative lower extremity ultrasound and intermediate BQ scan result. Here's the distribution of post-test probabilities that residents gave us by guessing. And they were right. We didn't have to know much to most of them said, ah, it lowers a little bit, maybe 30%, but not by a lot. So this was really helpful to see. And I wonder if this could serve as a way for us to keep a finger on the pulse of on how, where do we see more variability and where educational uh, efforts may need to be targeted in the future. And here, right here, there was some misconceptions about how much negative JVP and negative X-ray can decrease a really high pretest probability of heart failure. Some really anchored to the test results, but some kind of stayed up uh, high. So perhaps here uh, we could benefit from some uh, more learning on how powerful negative likelihood ratios are for these two. So some take home lessons, um, audio and video, avoid pitfalls, plan ahead. So you don't have to be me and re-record the same video five times. Uh, think about accessibility issues there. This is one of the resources, but there are some others as well. Think about housing the course could be as simple as putting it on OneDrive or you in the learning management system based on what your goals are. CME credits, they're competitive. Um, copyright implied, it's yours. Just put a statement in there, uh, but it, it can also use common, creative commons licenses to be more specific. Uh, and your work belongs to the university. If you're thinking about marketing, talk to the lawyers here. So, and lastly, just the last point I would like to make is that um, I think one of the um, things we should consider is how to reach learners where they are. And that's where they are a lot of times, uh, for better or for worse. And um, I think we should all be, as educators, be mindful of what are the, uh, is the landscape of how to deliver effective education changing and how can we keep up uh, with that. I would like to thank Lauren Macbeth, who is a project coordinator and collaborator. She did all the interviews. Um, 
Drew Baird is a clinical scholar from last year, uh, carried a heavy load in, in analyzing the data and data entry. Uh, Marisha Burden, as, as I'm sure all of you know, is the head of hospital medicine. She was visionary here. She's the one who told me to do this uh, online before we had COVID pandemic. So she really anticipated the need uh, for such thing as I was applying for the PACE program. Art Evans is my mentor from Wild Cornell, who I learned Bayesian reasoning from. So big thanks to him. And a really huge thank you to PACE Group, uh, Dr. Jeff Connors and uh, Dr. Susan Vandenberg, who supported me uh, developing this project. And I'm sorry I didn't put here Ava, who uh, really kept uh, us um, uh, moving along, sticking to our schedule and our deadlines really helped us uh, get this done. So thank you, Ava. That's all. I'll take questions for the next 10 minutes. I'm around great talk. Um, I think one of the things I liked the most was um, your your first few sort of topics around how to make uh, these decisions that we don't think about in terms of audio video easy. I think were invaluable. So thanks thanks for sharing that piece. I have a question for you that I'm sure you've considered, but um, uh, I'm going to throw out there anyway, which is people behave very differently when they're in a clinical learning environment versus when they're delivering clinical care. And I find myself doing this all the time. I'm looking at a patient who I think has heart failure, but that BNP value on the lab has a zero to hundred range and it's not in the right range. So how do you take what you're learning in the clinical, in the educational space and bring it to the clinical space? Have you thought about how would you even do it and how would you even test it? I, great question. Thank you so much for asking that question. I've thought a lot about that. So as part, I didn't present here because of time constraints, but another thing we did as part of the qualitative study was we gave our faculty who had taken this course a case. We were like, oh, so you're seeing this patient coming in with cough, looks like has COPD, and here's alpha-1 antitrypsin level. And it's not something that hospitalists are used to interpreting. So that's all I gave them, and there was like hidden buttons that they, they asked for the information, I could give it, or they could just say, I'm gonna call Palm and then ask, have them figure out what that means. And so we, without any, uh, predefined options. We wanted to kind of observe the behavior. What would happen after taking this course? Would they think, hmm, I'll maybe look up test characteristics. I would look at ROC curve, multi-level likelihood ratio. Is it a little low or very low? Is it diagnostic or is it something that makes um, uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency more likely? And it was a mixed bag. It was about half and half. Half said, I would see their ROC curve. And we showed them like, oh, they're like, oh, wow, that's diagnostic, that's really low. Uh, I'm pretty certain now that what the diagnosis is, but some said, well, I'm, I'm not so sure. I don't know, uh, probably call the pulmonary colleagues. So I think that it can move a needle in the right direction, but a lot of work needs to be done. And honestly, I agree uh, with one of the comments that this needs to be taught early because it's almost like developing habits. If you don't develop them early uh, on, you may not revisit them, even if you learn the content around them. The second aspect of that I've wondered a lot I read a pretty inspiring book by Malcolm Gladwell called Blink about our decision-making. And he talks about a sportsmen who, when they are out on the field in a soccer game, right? They're, they're not making rational decisions when they have the ball in the moment. Uh, they are not analyzing all the options. They're making split decisions. Uh, and they are able to make rational decisions not by thinking in the moment, but training before. And I kind of think of Bayesian reasoning that way, where a lot of times the, on the words, things are moving really fast. We don't really have time to slow down and look up the ROC curves and multi-level likelihood ratios. We are on the go. And what I'm hoping uh, something like this accomplishes is to fine tune those decisions to know, hmm, this is low, but I've seen situations where uh, when it's really low, it means something else. Kind of give them a prompt to slow down and ask the right questions, but really, uh, also at the same time, provide them with the skills to make better rapid decisions. So for example, if pretest probability of a diagnosis is really high, but the test result is kind of a little bit negative, right? don't change everything. Don't throw away your clinical judgment because one test is negative, but uh, stick to your 
pretest because it doesn't change a whole lot. So these are so, this is what I'm hoping this accomplishes, but so difficult to measure. So one of the things also explored and along, and along this domain was, could we see this happen in real world? And if we send someone to the words and say, hey, we're gonna have someone for Bayesian reasoning, we're gonna watch you. They may bring these things up because they're watched. So uh, one of the project ideas we had uh, back at Wild Cornell is to use natural language processing to look at the notes of medical students pre and post the course to see if they're thinking if, of how they thought about the patient, probabilities, uncertainty changed as they uh, learned more about the Bayesian reasoning. But I'm sure there are better ways to do this and I would love suggestions on how to really see whether this translates into a clinical practice and in what ways. I ask a question. I, you know, I think if a if a lay person saw the end of your talk, uh, the data on how physicians did, and they said, "All right, well, there's these doctors, and it's their job to know what to do with test results," and roughly 27% of them know what to do with test results. Um, this might be one of those things where we'd almost be afraid of what we'd find if we were to test everyone on their ability to Bayesian reason. But we would need to know if people know what to do with information. How would you get something like this out to all faculty? How would you sort of convince faculty that there may be a lot for you here to learn? Um, I'll, I'll give two answers uh, to that. One, by inspiring and teaching this early on to medical students, residents, because when they come to the wards armed with this knowledge, that is, the, I, I cannot see a greater incentive when your learner knows something and you don't as a, as a teaching faculty that you better <laughs> get your act together and learn that stuff. So that's one of the uh, uh, best incentives I can, uh, I can think about. But two, um, is that I honestly think, you know, I, I, you know, Dr. Schroeper, you talked about last uh, week on one of the greatest predictors of what type of uh, catheter was used, what uh, you know, single, uh, double, triple lumen, depending on the, the, um, what the default option was. And default option of the, how we view test results is dichotomous. The, the EMR is showing us it's positive and negative. That's all we have. So I think there's a lot of room for behavioral psychology here to see what would work to uh, convey the uncertainty in the test results to the clinicians, whether it's color coding of very, you know, very positive versus kind of positive versus in between with yellow versus very negative as green, shades of green. I'm not sure what would work, but I think that warrants a study on how to make it seamless. Because one of the issues is that a lot of times they understand the concepts, but the information they need on how much this test pertain changes te uh, the, uh, the probability of diagnosis is not readily available. They need to take that extra step. And when they need to take that extra step, a lot of times it won't happen. All right. Um, thank you so much. I have a kind of two-part question. Um, speaking as kind of residents who went through this, temporally, our pre and post test results were, you know, done pretty close in time. Is there plans to assess for retention of this information and incorporation into our clinical practice? And kind of in that same line, any plans for booster sessions to kind of maintain the learning? Next week. <laughs> <laughs> for real. Actually, uh, this week I created a review course that goes through all the concepts. And there's a case that sends, you know, starts from the basics and builds up all the way uh, to the ROC curves, multi-level likelihood ratios to summarize everything that's learned. So that will be part of the West session starting next week. And as part of that, one of the incentives besides review, uh, mm -hmm. I created a course is that before you have access to that course, you gotta take the quiz again. So we'll have the retention about nine months out from taking the course to see how much of the content you held on to. And I think that will be, uh, my guess is 80% have, have just, you know, flown out of your brain and that's fine. I, I don't expect that it will stick. This is, I, I, I think it's something that requires refreshing and kind of a culture change in how we think about these tests. Um, Amran, one of the questions that I had was, um, one of your slides mentioned that residents um, wanted access to ROC curves and multi-level likelihood ratios to use in real time. Um, and I was on the wards recently and was trying to figure out how much normal um, inflammatory markers should change my post-test probability of someone who had was admitted with a Crohn's flare. 
Are there any resources that you can recommend to us to find this information easily in real time? No. <laughs> and that's uh, partly, uh, it, it's, it's, frustrating, it's frustrating, but it's also, think about, uh, think about it as an opportunity. Uh, it, really, these resources don't, don't exist. That summarize these tests well, that's really, uh, that gives that level of nuance, that shades of gray. But that also is a scholarly opportunity uh, for, for many of you to produce that, to review the literature and apply these concepts and summarize it in a way that's easily accessible to the clinicians. Um, and you are doing that on BNP. <laughs> and a couple others in the in residency program actually uh, have worked on that stuff. So I think it's a huge undertaking, but exciting one. I think we should develop one. So that inspired a question for me as um, someone who sees a lot of patients where our tests are terrible in with regards to sensitivity and specificity. And so have there been thoughts about even in the EMR next to the tests, you have these great things like ranges, but what about putting things in there like, you know, just a generic, for example, ANAs? the bane of our existence as a rheumatologist, right? But having something in there saying like, by the way, an ANA is only this sensitive and specific for lupus, mm -hmm. for example. Um, I see that in our EMR, they're almost trying to do that with ANA because they list what percent of a uh, normal population will have a certain degree of abnormality, which I think is an infinite improvement to just normal abnormal. But I, I totally agree, and I would say even go to step far, go step farther and say not just sensitivity specificity, but say what is one to forty, what is one to eighty, what are the different likelihood ratios for each level of abnormality, how much does each change, probability that there's a true rheumatological condition going on, uh, because one of the uh, things when I talked about uh, trying to help our intuition is trying to learn what are the in betweens when you can say hmm I can kind of wait and see how things unfold versus, wait a minute, this goes way against my intuition, but the likelihood ratio is so strong, I better stop and check my intuition and rethink whether I'm right or not in this diagnosis. So, and such resource could definitely help. Uh, and I think that's the ultimate goal, really, to have it there uh, and easily accessible. We have time for one more question. Uh, thanks, Amaran. I loved your course. Um, Brady and I were just reminiscing about us doing it at about two in the morning uh, in the DH MICU. Uh, uh, but it was really clinically relevant. Uh, but one of the big things I remember is it was hard, a lot of it because you had to do the math. I mean, really uh, do some hard, uh, calculation. I mean, not hard calculations, but math. Um, yeah. And I, I just wonder in terms of like retention, like I really remember so many of these concepts about, you know, the higher, the value, the likelihood ratio isn't just the same. Um, but I don't know that I could still do all the exact math. And so how important is it for some of these concepts to really be able to stay in the nitty gritty over time? And is there some, um, goal to maybe just know that the concepts are retained? It's a great question. It actually studies looking at, um, how well we remember things based on, I forget what the study was about. Like they tweaked the, the, the font. It was a little hard to read and then show that like we were more likely to remember it because like that little effort you had to put in to understand it. I, that math is, is there on purpose. It's to get you to uh, work hard a little bit more. Because you don't really need to know that because the, the online calculators, they can create two post as easily. There's a Fagan nomogram. You can just put a line through it. I deliberately stayed away from that in the course to have that little extra challenge because you, you, even though you don't remember the math, you remember the most important concepts to think about how abnormal that is this? What does this really mean? And you understand how ROC curve slopes could give you different diagnostic information. And that is really what you need to know here. So that was a little bit of a deliberate trick. And I'm sorry, I had to <laughs> keep you up at two uh, going through that course. Uh, <laughs> That's great. It is one o'clock, so I'll go ahead and say, uh, Amran, thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs>